I'm just going to talk a little bit about our policy framework. Um, so we have um, put a lot of effort into the governance around this. Um, and so we have institutional policies and guidelines. And so on the left there is our learning analytics data use policy. And that's all about helping staff to fulfill their responsibilities and um, establishing a best practice culture about minimising the impact of harmful interventions, um, respecting student privacy, all those ethics and privacy type issues. And then on the right, we've got these guidelines, which is more of an operational type um, guidance in terms of how to then take the insights that are generated from the learning analytics and do something with those in terms of the organisational um, supports that are available for staff to then reach out to students proactively. In terms of the technical infrastructure, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. Uh, suffice to say that there's two main ways that staff um, can access the learning analytics, and that's either through the data warehouse that brings information together from a variety of different um, data sources, or directly through the inbuilt analytics within the learning platform itself. Um, and so that could be the Moodle, or um, we use Echo 360 for the lecture capture, um, and so on and so forth. A lot of those tools have inbuilt analytics functions, and so we encourage staff to use those as well. Okay, so these are the reports that we send out to, um, we call them subjects, um, but others call them courses, units, modules, basically what a student does over an academic session, right? And so we push out these um, pre-formatted -format, reports at key points in the academic session. And at the start of session, we ask that um, academics put a statement on their Moodle site that just makes it a bit more transparent for students that learning analytics is operating in those uh, units or subjects. Um, and then we uh, start to send out those reports. And down the bottom, we also send out these um, weekly reports that identify where it's been more than seven days uh, since a student has logged into a Moodle site as some sort of proxy measure for disengagement. Uh, that really came about um, in response to the, uh, the onset of the pandemic. Here are some uh, examples of those reports. So this is what we call, it's not our at-risk students report, it's our students of interest report. Uh, which does sound a bit, like, a bit like persons of interest, but you get the idea. It's students that are struggling to get their studies underway in the first couple of weeks of session. And, and so what we use is a number of different criteria, and then we rank um, the students on that list based on the criteria that they're meeting. So those that hit the most criteria will appear at the top of the report. So in this way, if you're an uh, instructor teaching a large subject of eight, 900 um, students or what have you, um, you've got this uh, one-page list um, that you can sort of focus your attention on in terms of students that um, aren't engaging with the studies. That's okay. Bear with Okay, um, so here's an example of a different report that goes out um, around the middle of session, and this is moving more from trying to predict which students are struggling to helping the academic reflect more on their teaching practice and uh, the ways in which students are interacting with the digital learning opportunities that are available to them. And so students may not be uh, interacting with those uh, things in the way that's intended, or um, there might be you know, some patterns that emerge that um, academics don't necessarily expect. And then as we're moving towards the last couple of weeks of session, we're trying to uh, provide more specific guidance in terms of those borderline pass students. They're sticking with the subject for better or worse. They're heading into those final assessments. So, and they're sitting on a borderline pass mark based on their assessments so far. And so where are they struggling? Trying to provide a bit more targeted academic support in those last few weeks before session in preparation for final assessments. Okay, so it um, doesn't quite look so good on the big screen there, sorry, but this is just giving you um, a uh, overview of the uptake of those reports over time. So in the blue is uh, undergrad subjects and in the red is postgrad subjects. And what it's showing you is the percentage of the student subject enrolments that I uh, receive these learning analytics report reports. And so 
where we are now is that 95% of undergrad uh, subjects now receive these reports. And the difference between undergrad and postgrad reflects the um, targeted approach where we've focused more on large first year undergrad subjects to help um, students in their transition into university. And so what we do is we send out a survey when we send the last report uh, at the end of session, which shows um, the um, you know, uh, final results for the subject and a, a bunch of other different student interaction information. Uh, and uh, we encourage the academics to then fill out a survey about their experience with these reports that we're sending out. Uh, and so response rate hovers at around 15, 16%. Um, and uh, there's a, a bit of variation there, and some of that's to do with um, the imp impact of the pandemic and timing of academic leave and that kind of stuff there. But um, so of the, I guess, five, 600 um, subjects that now receive these reports, there's a 15, 16% response rate to the survey that we send out. The survey, we try to keep it short and sweet. I think there's four or five questions, and then there's a fifth um, open-ended question at the end. So this first question you hear, um, sorry, a bit hard to see um, with the Zoom uh, menu at the top. Um, there you go. So um, the question is, because um, I can't actually remember myself <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, question one, uh, learning analytics provided me with insightful, insightful information that helps to identify and support students who needed early attention. And so it's a five point like a scale that we use there. And, and what we see is, um, you know, in terms of if we uh, group together the agree and strongly agree, um, there's uh, about 83% um, would either agree or strongly agree that those reports provide useful information, right? So that, that's, you know, stabilized over the last couple of years um, in those results. Um, so that's encouraging. And I might just keep that menu there, you get the idea. Second question is talking about whether it saves time in the delivery of the subjects. And so the results are a bit different here. Um, in terms of agree or strongly agree, it's, it's now 45%, right? So much lower. Um, so that, that suggests there's a further opportunity for investigating the ways in which we could relieve some of the administrative burden for academics in the delivery of the subjects. Um, and uh, yet yeah, it kind of um, speaks to the, um, the issues of trustworthiness as well in terms of just how much these reports can help these um, often time poor academics. Third question we've got here, um, whether learning analytics helps them, uh, prompts them to ask new questions about the design and delivery of their subjects. So here the agreement rate uh, for the last four academic sessions, roughly around 65%, um, with the, the blue and the, the dark blue and the red. Um, so it, it still indicates that majority of the subject um, coordinators or instructors uh, still find new insights uh, that they would not otherwise be aware of. Um, and I guess the, the standard nature of those reports with, uh, that I was showing you samples of before, it does limit the depth of analytical insights that can be generated from the data. So um, regardless of what um, subject uh, or course that you, you're, um, you're teaching, the reports do look and feel the same, right? And so um, th there's only going to be a certain number of questions, I suppose, that you can ask from those um, pre-formatted reports. Um, and it's also worth noting that as we've scaled this, we do have a large tail of subjects with small enrollment sizes, right? And so the, the learning analytics may not be as relevant in a class of 20 or 30 compared to a class of eight, 900 as well. So we've got a lot of those um, smaller subjects that now receive these reports. Okay, and so now we're asking about the inbuilt features of Moodle. Now, this is a bit different. Um, are they aware um, or familiar? Are they familiar and confident or are they not familiar? So, yeah, there's some interesting results here as well. And I guess um, it, overall it shows that, um, you know, 81% are, are aware of those um, features, but not a lot of them are confident in how to use them. So it suggests opportunities for further professional development and supporting staff use of those inbuilt analytics 
it's not just about the, the pretty pictures in the reports that we create. We want to um, help them harness what's there in those inbuilt tools. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the other aspect is, well, how can we maybe uh, develop more customised enhancements within those um, learning platform uh, tools that are at the academic's fingertips rather than having another system that they need to log into or you know, another way of receiving analytics. How can we embed that into their existing processes as well? And that's what it kind of suggests. Okay, and then our last question you hear um, with the, the quantitative stuff is um, that it helps, uh, the reports provide clear and helpful instructions for follow-up actions to support students. Um, so in terms of the agreement rate, we're looking at about 74% there with the red and the blue together. Um, and so uh, generally there's, you know, they feel that there's clear guidance, but there is still opportunity to, uh, you know, take out, uh, provide more support in how to take action. Uh, which is only going to continue to grow as um, there's more uh, demand for automated type of student interventions. And then we ask a qualitative question around um, anything else that they would like. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go into details there, but um, things like more detailed analytics, um, I just mentioned automated student interventions and more guidance on how to act on it and more frequent reports as well. So through all of that, um, what, what we're thinking now is this kind of test and learn approach or, you know, you have heard co-design um, at other sessions here at LAC um, and, you know, having success criteria with regular checkpoints, checking in um, with that. And we've already commenced with that type of approach. So rather than having those static reports, we're, work, um, we're now rolling out uh, interactive dashboards. And, and so essentially those screenshots that I was showing you before, trying to combine all of those different reports into the one dashboard and having it interactive so that teachers can ask different questions of the data. Um, and so here's some screenshots uh, of the um, prototype that we're pilot and testing at the moment. And uh, yeah, um, it, we're receiving positive feedback about that. So I just wanted to uh, elaborate a bit more on, okay, where to next? Um, so it, we've got promising results and it is kind of a business as usual state now at the University of Wollongong in terms of um, familiarity of learning analytics in the way that it's been conceptualized. But what we're seeing now is we need to kind of reconceptualize some of that with the, the co-design and how to scale that it is um, an interesting challenge um, because uh, in my role as manager of learning analytics, I'm always thinking about scalability, right, um, which may not be entirely relevant based on particular teaching and learning contexts. And, and so, uh, yeah, trying to meet in the middle somehow with this co-design approach. Um, but also setting priorities collaboratively because um, through representation of different stakeholders, it might be that we decide to do a more targeted thing in one particular part of the university and another part of the university is happy to wait because there's transparency in terms of that priority setting, it builds that trust. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks.